All right. <clears throat> well, praise God. Good things are happening and uh, will continue to happen. I'm excited. Church, I don't care what is going on in our world today. Nothing can stop the kingdom of God from advancing. Can I just state really clearly, church, the only thing that's going to prevent God's kingdom from going forward is us. It's us. You know, God wants us to move forward. God wants to see great things happening in our world today. <clears throat> the devil can't stop it. Jesus said, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So the devil can't stop it. Listen to me. Sickness and disease can't stop it. The only people that can stop it is if we just quit. If we just kind of lay low and just kind of hibernate and isolate and insulate and whatever. You know what? God wants us to, God wants us to be hot wires for Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen, letting, us, letting the power of God flow through our lives and getting involved in people's lives and touching people with the love of God and the power of God and the gospel of Christ. And tell you what, church, God is on the move. Amen, Amen. I'm excited. Let's keep walking with them. Let's keep going forward. Hallelujah. Amen, that's just my little cheerleader rah-rah moment right there, but that's, that's so important to understand. So I'm excited. Glory to God, let's keep moving. Let's keep going. I'm in a series, we're in a series right now that I started last week called, Do You Trust Me? And that statement, that question is not from my perspective, that is from God's perspective, asking us as the church, his body, do you trust me? And God is really wanting us to help us understand the importance of trust. And so before we get into this, <clears throat> I just thought I'd just, you know, I know some of you really have been missing my dad jokes lately. Yeah. Haven't you? Yeah. I know, I know, and, and I feel for you. So <clears throat> I'm going to deliver a couple of them to you this morning. You know, I, uh, <clears throat> I don't trust the tree that I have growing in my backyard, speaking of trust. <laughs> you know why? Because it seems kind of shady. That's, that's why. And so, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wait, wait, I got another one. <clears throat> I know, they get better. You, you, know, you know atoms, you know molecules and atoms, right, atoms? You know why you can't trust atoms? Because they make up everything. Right? That's right, they do. <clears throat> Man, they just keep on making things up. So, anyways. All right, thanks for humoring me. In Jeremiah chapter 17, this is a portion of scripture that we looked at last week. And <clears throat> I just want to remind you of it before we get into what God has for us this week. But the prophet Jeremiah speaking and prophesying to the nation of Israel, and this is a principle. Please understand, church, that yes, we are living in New Testament times, but understand that the principles of the Old Testament can be transferred into the new. The method changes, the principles don't. And so what we need to understand is what God says about blessing and curse. Watch what he says. He said, cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes his flesh his strength. Don't forget what the word cursed means. The word curse is the opposite of blessing. It's like darkness is the opposite of light. You know, cold is the opposite of heat. How many want to just pray for heat right now? Just start flowing into our... Yeah, okay. So really, really, it's just the absence of something. And so curse is really the absence of blessing. And so it, let's just define what blessing is. The blessing is the empowerment of God on someone to succeed or to prosper. It's the empowerment of God. It's the enabling power of God. So a curse is simply the absence of the enabling power of God for our prosperity or for our success. When we fail to trust in God, we are not operating in his blessing. Watch what it says. Blessed is the man, verse seven, who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the water, which spreads out its roots by the river, and will not fear when heat comes. But its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. And so we've been looking at how, as we trust God, you benefit from what you trust in. If you trust in man, you'll benefit from the limitations of man's strength. But if you trust in God, you benefit from the infinite power of his strength. Who do you want to trust in, man or God? When you trust in God, now watch, he describes how it's like a tree planted by the waters whose roots go down in order for its foliage and for its fruit to become prosperous and to bear much. And that's what we want in life. We want to see the prosperity of God's people. And by the way, when I use the word prosperity, I want you to understand that's a biblical term. 
That's a biblical term. I know some people in Christendom say, I don't want to hear that word, that prosperity thing that you guys are just, pro- are you a prosperity preacher? Well, I'd rather be a prosperity preacher than a poverty preacher. Yeah. Are you one of those faith preachers? Yep, I would, I would rather be a faith preacher than a doubt preacher. All right? So yes, I believe in faith. I believe in prosperity. But I don't believe that we just use God as a magic genie in the bottle that we call, that, that does our bidding, whatever we want him to do. That's not faith. That's presumption. That's operating in the flesh. Only what God says do we believe. And what God says we believe, we confess. That's faith. All right, so yes, God wants us to prosper. By the way, church, it, the Bible's full of verses like that. You know, Psalm 1, the very first Psalm out of 150 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, which he meditates day and night, and he shall be like a tree that bears much fruit. Amen. Amen. And, and his leaf shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. So God's into prosperity. Right. Amen. So don't, don't reject that. Prosperity is simply having more than enough Amen. to meet your needs and the needs of others. Amen. God wants to prosper you so that not only your needs are met, but so that you can also be a blessing for somebody else to meet their needs. Amen. Wouldn't you rather have more than enough so that you can take care of not only yourself, but others around you as well? Yes. Don't just think that I just want enough for myself. You know, I'm just, I, just, I just want to take care of myself. I'm not, I don't want to bother with anybody else. I, I just want enough for me. I, that's all I ask for. I'm not into a whole lot of, you know, excess. Well, that's selfish. Really? That's, that's selfish. Because <laughs> who are you thinking of? You. That's it. Just give me enough for me. That's a very self. Jesus was not just into him. Jesus, how many know that Jesus was, I mean, ultimately, he was the greatest example we had of prosperity and blessing. And wherever he went, he just gave out of his resources. Whatever he had to give. And by the way, there was some pretty supernatural resource making going on, right? Feeding 5,000 people with like a few, you know, fish and a couple loaves, like, praise God. But, but, but just so I, you, know, you understand, church, that God wants to bless you. God wants to prosper you because he's got other people in mind. I shared with you last week that when you begin to trust God, God will, you will tap into the blessing of God in your life because God wants to bless you. But he's got two people in mind, you and somebody else. Okay, let me just break that down a little bit further for you. Okay, I've, I've brought it this way. There are two reasons why the blessing of God, God has a blessing for your life. And I've shared with you, you and somebody else. But let me just, the somebody else part, God just kind of put this in my thought. God wants to bless you, yes, for your success and for your prosperity. <laughs> Say prosperity. prosperity. Third John verse two says this, beloved, I pray above all things that you may be in good health and prosper even as your soul prospers. Amen. Psalm, you know what? Psalm 35 verse 27 says this, oh, magnify the Lord with me. And then it goes on to say this, for he takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. Amen. All right, say prosperity. prosperity. God wants to prosper you for your sake and for God's sake, for his sake. Amen. Okay, what I, what, what I mean by that is this. Okay, yes, for your sake. We're already getting the picture. But for his sake, because every time, church, that you have an opportunity of turning around and blessing somebody with what you've been blessed with, you're doing it under the Lord. Amen. He said this, as much as you've done it under the least of these, my brethren, you've done it under me. Amen. Matthew 25, it talks about where we see those who are poor, those who are without, those who were in prison, those who are destitute, and we help them and we serve them and we bless them and we give unto them that in that day of reward, that day of judgment, he will say to me, hey, well done. Well done, enter into the joy of your inheritance for as much as you've done it under the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. Amen. And church, every time we do it for somebody, we are helping advance God's cause in the world. We're helping other people discover that there's a God in love with them. And so when you make something happen for others, believe me, church, God's gonna make something happen for you because if he can get it to you and through you, he wants to bless you with more. Okay, so, and I mean this with all due respect and sincerity and genuineness of the term, of the word sake. For God's sake. Amen. Trust him. Yes. 
The word sake means purpose, for God's purpose. Yeah. Trust him, because he's got a great purpose for your life, and he's got a great purpose for his kingdom on this earth. So trust comes from the heart, and your heart reveals your love and your loyalty. So whom you trust, you are loyal to. Whatever controls your heart will control your trust. That's why God will test your heart. That's why he's going to search your heart. He wants your heart, church. He wants your heart. Because he knows that your heart is the seat of where trust comes from, love comes from, loyalty comes from, faithfulness comes from. And if he can see you trustworthy in your loyalty and in your faithfulness, he will gladly pour his blessing in and through you because he knows he can trust you. Amen. Untrusting people are, are people that can't trust or people that you can't trust. Yeah, that's right. So he looks for the trust factor in your life before he trusts you with more. I'm gonna prove that out in scripture as we get going here. In Jeremiah 17, as we were already there, look at verse 10. Uh, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I mean, right? We talked about that last week. I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind. Even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. He says, I test the heart. I search the heart. I test the mind. God, listen to me, church. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. Okay? But he's also interested in making sure your heart is right. We say this all the time. God loves you just the way you are, but he loves you too much to keep you that way. And so he's going to search. He's going to test you. He's going to ask certain things of you. Why? Because he cares about you. He wants to see you the best that you can be. And so he's going to put you to the test sometimes. He's going to ask certain things of you at times that are going to make you feel uncomfortable. He's going to ask things sacrificially of you that you're going to go, I don't really care to do that. I, that kind of disturbs me. That kind of upsets me. That kind of makes me feel uncomfortable. Church, listen to me. God is more interested in your character than your comfort. Amen. Right? You've got that, I hope, by now. He's more interested in your integrity. He's more interested in your purity. He's more interested in who you are so that you can represent him well than in your comfort. So he's going to ask certain things. Throughout scripture, God asks different things of different people in very difficult times that caused them to get outside their comfort zone because God had a blessing in store for them and somebody else. So we talked about many, many things that are going to vie for your heart. They're going to vie for your trust. They're going to vie for position in your life. Okay, family, jobs, um. You know, time, you know, sleep, whatever, I mean, food. Many things are gonna vie for that first place in your heart, in your life. Money. Money is one of the biggest things that will try to vie for that place in your heart because it's, it's what we're looking for, what we all look for as human beings is we're looking for security. We're looking for pleasure. We're looking for comfort. We're looking for fulfillment, And so we will look to things that will satisfy those areas of need. Now, here's the thing, church. Our flesh naturally tends to go towards the things that are tangible that we can get our hands on. But God doesn't want those things to take his place. He wants to be first place. So let's go to Luke chapter 16 quickly. Luke 16. And I want to begin reading at verse 10. Luke 16, verse 10. And Jesus now begins to bring up the issue of money. And I know that every time we talk about money, I know that many of you, maybe, maybe many of you that are watching, and, and maybe perhaps I don't want to become accusational or assumptional, but maybe perhaps some of you don't, you know, don't even want to listen to this message right now because it has to do with, oh, oh, he said money. Uh, turn the channel, honey. Let's try to watch something else right now. Maybe, right? Okay, stay with me. Hang with me. Okay? Because if money makes you feel uncomfortable, there's something wrong with your heart. If, the, if money pops up, you know, well, you shouldn't be talking about money in church. Well, Jesus did. 
A third of his parables have to do with finances and money and riches and wealth. As a matter of fact, he spoke more about money than he did heaven and hell. Why? Because he knows that money is a driving, influential, powerful force in our lives that if we don't tame it, it will master us. And church, that's the very thing that God is opposed to is that somebody would take his place as God and master. So if money, if the topic of money, when it comes to Christianity, when it comes to your faith, when it comes to your walk with God, if that bothers you, then there's something wrong with your heart. Okay, watch this. Look at Luke 16, verse 10. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. He who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. So Jesus is just bringing up a principle of if we can't handle that which is less, who would want to entrust to us more? Okay, that just makes sense. If we can't be trusted with little, why would anybody give us more? So we got to learn how to just trust with the little that we have and be faithful with the little that we have and, and, and obey God with the little that we have in order that God would say, now you're trustworthy for me to give you more. Therefore, if you have not been faithful, now watch this, in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? So the unrighteous mammon, there's a term in scripture called this mammon thing. And it's in reference to wealth, but more than just that. There's another word in scripture in the New Testament, it's the word krema, and, and it's also, it also means money. Okay, but Jesus didn't say, you know, he didn't say, therefore, you have not been faithful in, in krema. He said in mamos, which is the translation mammon, and he's talking about a specific type of wealth. And what it's in reference to is anything that is of value or wealth to us that has a powerful influence in our lives, is influential, okay? Um, it's got, a, it's got a, almost like a personality to it. It has that much influence on your life that it begins to shape the way you are, okay? That's what he's talking about here. He's talking about wealth that has influence on your life that begins to shape your identity and shape your belief and shape who you are. And he said this, if you can't be faithful with money and overcome that influence in your life, who will entrust you the true riches? Now, what are the true riches? True riches, what's the most valuable asset on this planet? People. 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 People are the most valuable asset on this planet. There's nothing more valuable to God than people. And what God is wanting to do is he wants to, in, he wants to use your faithfulness to help minister to somebody else but he's gonna test your heart to see whether or not you're faithful and trustworthy with the little before he gives you people. I take this very seriously, church, very seriously, because I begin to realize that God has a plan and purpose for my life, and if he can't get past my insecurities and my lack of trust, then I limit what God is going to do in my life. And I don't want to, at the end of the day, stand before him and say, well, you know what? I would have and I could have and I should have, but you know, I really need to care about me and my family. And so money was just a big, sorry, Lord. Okay, I don't want to get there. I don't want to be that guy. Okay, I want to be the guy that at the end of the day, I've done whatever God has asked me to do. Am I perfect? No, no, no. Have I got work to do? Yes, yes, yes. But at least I'm making an effort. I'm pushing towards, I'm moving forward. I'm saying, God, I wanna trust you. And this is an area that God has tested me in. And I was, I was that selfish guy at the beginning. I was. I was that guy that, you know what? When we went out as a group of guys, I purposely didn't leave my wallet at home. You know, and then when it came time to pay, it was like, oh my goodness, I forgot my wallet. Ah, oh, dude, do you want to get it this time? I'll get it next time. Okay? I was, a, I was a cheap wad, man. I'll tell you, I was just, I was bad that way. <clears throat> but God got a hold of my heart. And in order for him to get me further ahead in his walk, in my walk with him, he began to really address the 
the, 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 the money issue in my life. Show me scriptures like this and point out areas of my selfishness and begin to ask certain things for me. And, and maybe I'll share more of this next week, but um, there has been many occasions where God has asked certain things for me, and I'll share more of this next week, that I didn't want to give, but out of obedience to the Lord and breaking free from my selfishness and giving out of trusting God, I've seen the supernatural provision of God like never before. Many times, many times. I remember one day, I, and I'll quickly share this one story for you, but I, ha, I remember one day the Lord shared with me that I was supposed to give $100 to this lady in the church. And um, I happened to carry it with me with me that morning because I, I felt the Lord was prompting me to do something like that. And he pointed her out to me that morning. And I was a little bit, I, you know, and again, it was one of those situations where I just, I want to obey God. Yes. And so the Lord said, that's the woman. And I went up to the lady and I had a conversation with her and she began to tell me about her struggles right now, financially, barely, barely able to make rent that month and so forth. And I said, well, it just happens to be, ma'am, that the Lord put on my heart this morning to give you this. And I gave her the $100 and she began to cry and she thanked me profusely. And I just said, you know what? God bless you. God loves you. God puts you on my heart to, sh- to give this to you because he cares about you. Okay, a week later... I, we have the community mailboxes. Went to my mailbox, and in the mail, there was a check for $1,000 from a random person that said, God just put you on my heart. I wanted to bless you with this. Amen. I thought, Amen. okay, where's the next woman? Here's the, here's the. No, I didn't. But I just began to realize you can never outgive God. Amen. See, church, when God puts a request on your heart, he's testing it, but he's got a blessing in mind for you and for somebody else. And so my wife and I love to give. I mean, we have grown into this. This is something that my wife and I do. You know, we love and enjoy doing it. We're givers. And um, it surprises us at the end of the year when we get our, you know, donation receipt from the church, just how much we actually have given. And I'm not gonna give a number out, but I just, I want you to know that, um, yeah, we're... um, probably the, one of the top givers in the church. Yeah, and, and, and that's not something that we just strive to do. You know, it's not like we want to be the best. It's like, it just happens to be. <laughs> it's like, oh well, my goodness, wow. But that's awesome because it, we just love. We love blessing other people. And, and there's something about that. And so God, listen to me, church, God will take you to the level of your trust and you've got to be willing to be trustworthy. Look at verse 12. And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, also heard these things, and they derided him. All right, so Jesus then begins to bring up this vying position uh, between God and between this, this influential wealth that seems to play on our hearts to try to give us this sense of security that we're looking for. And what he's saying is this, that when you begin to put money, and by the way, can I just say this? Money is not evil, okay? I, I, again, I wanna remind you, you know, people quote, you know, 1 Timothy 6.10 wrong all the time. They say, they say Law, money is the root of all evil. The Bible says the money is the root of all evil. No, it doesn't. It doesn't say that. It says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And so when our heart is in love with money, it can take you directions and places and do things that you should not be doing, right? How many people are in prison today because of the love of money? How many crimes are committed because of the love of money? How many relationships are broken because of the love of money, right? And so God really wants us to get control of our money so that our money doesn't become controlling us. He said that you will love the one, hate the other, or you'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. And so God shows us that we can't allow money to become our pleasure, our passion, our pursuit, our security, our fulfillment. Because the minute that you begin to put money in first place in your life, here's what you're doing. You're replacing God with money. And money now becomes your master. Money now becomes your God. And church, by doing that, it violates the first commandment that God gave us. You shall have no other gods before me. Don't make money an idol. Don't make it a God. And you say, well, I don't. 
Okay, God's gonna test you. God will test you. Okay, let's go to Mark chapter 10 and watch how God tests. Mark chapter 10, look at verse 17. This is a classic story, You're probably familiar with this story. It's the story of the rich young ruler who comes to Jesus one day, has a question to ask Jesus. And I love the sincerity of his heart. He starts off by saying this. Now, as he was going, Jesus was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Okay, he wants to know. Okay, he's interested in spending eternity in heaven with God. Good question to ask, sincere. Okay, Jesus said, okay, first of all, why did you say I'm good? You know, there's only one, that's God. But in other words, and by the way, people get confused with that statement that Jesus made because he wasn't denying his deity. What he was just saying was, if you don't know that I am God, then why did you call me good? Okay, anyways, look at verse 19. You know the commandments. Jesus now begins to give him commandments to follow, okay? Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. Okay, you need to understand this, by the way, church, that even though that's written in the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew, it's still in Old Testament time. In other words, Jesus hadn't yet gone to the cross. He hadn't yet died for the sins of the world. He hadn't yet risen from the dead. It's still under old covenant law. And according to the law, the only way that you could be saved or right, made righteous was by the keeping of the law, yeah. right? And so Jesus just basically gave him that. By the way, the law church is, the law was given <clears throat> simply, you know, to help people understand how to love God and how to love other people. If you look at the 10 commandments, the first four are how to love God. The last six are how to love other people. Right, and, and as a matter of fact, another time, I'll get back to the story here in a second, but a lawyer comes to Jesus one day and says, what's the greatest commandment? Okay, he's testing him on the law. What's the greatest commandment? And Jesus said this, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like unto it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And all these, these two commandments hang the law of the prophets. In other words, basically, all, so the, the law is basically summarized into these two, love God, love others. And Jesus came to fulfill the law. As a matter of fact, in Matthew chapter 5 or 17, he said this, that I didn't come to destroy the law, I came to fulfill it. What he was saying was this, was that the law was pointing people towards the need to live a certain way, but the law was also the means of becoming righteous, right? Under the old covenant law, it was the means of becoming righteous. If you kept the law perfectly, you'd become right with God. You'd have righteousness. But how many know that that was impossible? Right? Nobody could do that. They'd sin all the time. And so the, the law was a tutor. It was simply showing us that we can't do it in our own ability or our own strength. It pointed us towards the need of a savior. Yeah. And so Jesus came and he said this, I didn't come to destroy the law. In other words, I didn't come to destroy the fact that the law points towards loving God and loving others. I came to fulfill it. In other words, I came to, I came to fulfill the requirement of the law, which was righteousness. And so I'm gonna take upon myself the sin that you, that you have caused on your own selves, but I'll bear your sin for you in exchange to give you the righteousness that the law was trying to produce in you but couldn't, but I'm gonna give it to you by grace. And so here's the righteousness. But what Jesus didn't do by doing that was to eliminate the moral code of the law. He said, you still need to love God, honor him first, don't put any other God before him. Aren't you glad, church? I know that some people, New Testament believers are saying, well, we're not under the law anymore. So that means we're not under tithing. We'll get to tithing a little bit more at the end and then we'll talk, pick it up again next week. But church, when they say that kind of thing, it's like saying this, well, we're not under the law. Well, okay, does that mean then that if the law said you shall not steal, that now we can go ahead and steal? The law says you shall not kill. I guess we're not under the law, so every man for himself. <laughs> right? No. The law says you shall honor your father and your mother, but I'm not under the law anymore. So mom and dad, no, right? There's still the moral compass of the law in order to help us to relate to God and to relate to other people. The issue is that the law does not make us righteous. Jesus does. But the, the law does help us understand how to relate to one another, to God and to one another. Okay, so I hope you got that. Okay, so Jesus, by the way, he gives this man the law. Again, Old Testament time still, so the law was the means of righteousness, so he gives him these, these commandments. Then the rich young ruler says in verse 20, 
He said to him, teacher, all these things I've observed from my youth. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, and stop there for a second because I want you to say that, I want you to know this, church, despite our imperfections, God loves you. He loved him. And I want you to know, church, God loves you. Well, I don't give that much money. He still loves you. He still loves you. But you're not, you're, you know what, by not giving, you're, not, you're hurting yourself. And you're hurting the fact that God can't use you to help other people. But he loves you. Okay, understand that. He loves you. And then he said, one thing you lack. Okay, here comes the test. Okay, you think you're good. You think you got it all together. <laughs> I'm saved. I'm born again. I'm going to heaven. Praise God. How many are born again going to heaven? Okay, pretend Jesus is here right now and he's looking at your heart and he says, hey, that's great. I love you. You're going to heaven. But one thing you lack. How many would like to hear the one thing you lack from Jesus? Okay, yeah. Show me what I lack, Lord. What is it that I lack? Okay, And he's pointing some things out in our hearts now that he wants to see perfected. He wants to see matured. He wants to see some growth happening in our lives. Okay, again, he loves you just the way you are, but he loves you too much to keep you that way. Yeah. So he's gonna ask something. Go your way, sell whatever you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross and follow me. In other words, live a sacrificial life in obedience to me. But the young man said, he was sad at his word and went away grieved for he had great possessions. There was a heart test right there. And he didn't do very well. He was upset. And remember what Jesus said? You can't serve God and mammon for either you will love the one or hate the one and love the other or you will be loyal to the one and despise the other. In other words, church, here's the test. When God asks something of you that you hold on to very tightly and dearly because you can't afford, you think you can't afford to give it away and God asks for it, what's your attitude towards God at that moment? Do you love him or hate him? Or are you loyal to him or you despise him? And there are times, church, where God's going to put the finger on certain things on your heart and point it out and ask for something, and you're going to have to make a decision. But church, I pray, I pray, I pray that you don't become hateful towards what God wants from you. If God asks for your money, how does it make you feel? God told you to sell all that you have and give it away, come and follow me, would you do it? See, we've got to get to the place, church, and I I know that's a question that we all have to answer for ourselves. And by the way, God, you know, I'm not asking, I'm not saying on behalf of God, okay, everybody sell everything you have, give it away, and uh, let's just live on the street and serve people. Okay, I'm not not saying that. I don't believe God's telling you to do that. But if God did say that to you, because he knows how much money has a grip on your heart, would you be willing? And we've got to get to that place, church, and this is one thing I've learned in my life. I've got to get to that place that no matter what God asks of me, I've got to be willing to say, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I may not feel like it. I, I may not understand it, but I'll obey. Because I want, at the end of the day, God to be God, not money. I want my trust, my confidence, my fulfillment, my satisfaction, my joy to be in Christ Jesus, not in a dollar, not in money. I'm thankful that I can use money to bless other people and help situations out, but I don't want it to take the place of Christ in my life. Okay, so quickly, um, in Mark chapter four, Jesus gives us this parable. And he has the parable of the sower and the seed. And he's got these four types of soil. One's hard ground, one's stony ground, one's thorny ground, one's good fertile soil. You remember the parable, right? Yeah. Sower sows the seed, some falls by the wayside, some falls on stony, some falls on thorny, some falls on good fertile soil. He describes each of these soils for us to understand the parable. And when he gets to the story or, or, the, or the, the soil of the thorny soil, 
He gives us conditions to this type of soil. In other words, where the seed is sown, but it doesn't bear much fruit in that soil because certain things in that soil begin to happen. He describes them as the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of pleasures, or sorry, the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things. Did you notice, and you'll find this in Mark 4, verse 18 and 19, by the way. Mark 4, verse 18 and 19. We're not gonna turn there for the sake of time, but you write it down if you want. But he describes that soil as soil that's contaminated or cluttered with the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things. You notice he uses the term deceitfulness of riches. And that's because mammon is deceitful. It'll lie to you. It'll try to believe something that is not true. Let me give you two lies that mammon will try to speak to you. Number one, the more money you have, the more valuable you are. Listen to me, church, understand this. Your value is not tied up in your possessions. Your value is tied up in your identity in Christ. Listen to what Luke 12, verse 15 says. Take heed and beware of covetousness, that insatiable appetite for more all the time. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Your life does not consist of the abundance that you possess. When God looks at your life and God looks at your value, it's not tied up in what kind of car you drive, what kind of house you live on, live in, you know, whether you have a, a cottage at the lake or a boat in your garage or, or how many cars you have parked in your driveway. That's not, or even what kind of job you have or what kind of dollar amount you have in your bank account. That's not your value, church. Your value is in Christ Jesus. Your value is you're a child of God. Listen, Psalm 139, verse 14, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. No dollar signs attached to that verse, by the way. Psalm 17, verse eight, that we are the apple of God's eye. Please understand your value and your identity. A lot of times people like to have more for, for social status. Look at what I drive, look at the rings on my finger, look at the clothes that I wear, look at the job that I have, look at the, you know, all the different things that I possess. Wow, look at me. Church, money should never have you. You should have it. Money should serve you. You shouldn't serve it. And I understand, church, that it's nice to have good things. It's great to have nice things. I'm not against nice things. I'm not against having a good, nice car or two if you need it. Amen, I'm not. God isn't either, by the way. I'm gonna show you some verse. Listen, Abraham was one of the richest, wealthiest men on the earth, but he was a blessed man because he knew how to take his money and give it away. As a matter of fact, the scripture tells us that he tithed. He tithed to Melchizedek. That's right. Jacob, his grandson, tithed to the Lord. Right. 400 years before the law was ever introduced. Amen. So before you start saying that the tithe is under the law, it's not. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself, quickly. Okay, um, so we see then that there are, there are um, tests that God will, will give us. Here's the second lie, deceitfulness of, of, of mammon. Number one was that it, you know, it determines your value. That's not true. Number two, the more money I have, the more fulfilled I'll be. How many know that money doesn't bring fulfillment? It does bring a satisfaction, but it ultimately doesn't last. That's right. Because you'll need more. 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 But listen, look at, look at Solomon. Go with me to Ecclesiastes chapter two. Who praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Say, I am blessed because I trust the Lord and not money. Ecclesiastes chapter two, look at verse four. Now, Solomon, anybody heard of Solomon? Okay, so Solomon was the son of David and Solomon was a wise man. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> apart from Jesus, was the wisest man that probably was on the planet ever lived. And uh, God blessed him with that ability, by the way, because he asked for it. He trusted God for it in his earlier days of his kingship. And, uh, and he became the wealthiest man as well. As a matter of fact, look at 
Verse, verse four, I, I made, this is Solomon speaking, I made my works great. I built my houses. I planted myself vineyards. I made myself gardens and orchards and I planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made myself water pools, swimming pools from which to water the groves, uh, the growing trees of the grove. I acquired male and female servants and I had servants born in my house. Yeah, yeah, I had greater possessions of herds and flocks than all who were in Jerusalem before me. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and special treasures of kinds of all kinds of provisions. I acquired male and female singers and delights of the sons of men and musical instruments of all kinds. So I became great and, and excellent more than all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep away from them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure. For my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my reward from all my labor. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had done. Stop there for a second. So here is Solomon saying, look at all that I amassed. Look at all the wealth that I accumulated. Look at my yard. My, I mean, it goes forever. I've got all the servants I need. I got the handmaids, the servants. I got concubines and, and combines and all sorts of things. I've got it all. I got everything I could possibly need. I've got it. I've got silver and gold. I got clothing. I got, I got it all. I mean, anything my eyes saw and I wanted, I got it. And then watch what he says. He said, I would, look at verse 11 again. I looked at all the works that my hands had done and on the la- all the labor in which I had toiled and indeed all was vanity empty, futile, and grasping for the wind. There was no profit under the sun. He, began, he realized, you know what? It didn't satisfy. It didn't fulfill. I'm still longing. Then he comes to the conclusion at the end of the book. If you look at the end of Ecclesiastes in chapter 12, look at the verse, last two verses of that whole book. He said this. He said, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. So he writes the book basically saying this, oh, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. I've accumulated this, I got this, I did this, I had that position, I had that person, I had that wife. And then all was vanity, it never filled the hole. Then he said this, let all, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. For fear God, this is what he concluded, fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether it is good or whether it is evil. Solomon came to the conclusion, listen, I would rather be poor and trust Jesus than have riches and not. He realized at the end of the day what really, really mattered the most. Okay, so here's the test God uses to test our heart in, in areas of riches and finances. I'm not a guy into numerology, you know, the study of numbers. I'm not that kind of a guy that is too big on, you know, because I saw that number, that means this, and that number, that means this. I am a man of theology. I love studying God and his word, and I love the patterns of scripture. And I do notice and see certain patterns that happen in the Bible with certain numbers. For example, um, and we all kind of know some of these numbers, but for those that maybe don't, the number six, for example, the number six is the number of man, right? God, God created man on what day? The sixth day. As a matter of fact, Revelation 13 talks about, you know, the Antichrist and that he, it's the number of the beast and the number of a man, which is 666. Six, six. So we can see then that that number is referenced to a man or men or mankind. Number eight, for example, in, the, in scripture is the number that speaks of new beginning. God created everything within how many days? Six days. He rested on the seventh day and then things began on the eighth day. How many, how many did Noah, including himself, were on the ark when God started mankind all over again? Eight. Eight. Noah's wife, his three boys, and their three wives, right? So there was eight total. There were eight on the ark. <clears throat> um, the number 12, for example. The number 12 is the number of government. And, uh, for example, Jesus had 12 disciples. How many tribes of Israel were there? Twelve. And so you can see the governance or the authority here uh, in that sense Number 12 represents that. Number 40 in scripture talks about testing. You know, how many years was Moses in the wilderness before God called him to go to Egypt? 40 years. How many years was Israel in the wilderness before God sent them into 
the land of promise after testing them and purging them in the wilderness. 40 years. How many days was Jesus in the wilderness tempted by Satan? 40. So you can see 40 as a pattern in scripture of testing. And so you see that. Okay, so that, there's patterns like that that happen. So there's another number, number 10. Number 10 is a number that's significant and it usually is in reference to requirement. For example, how many plagues was, was, did God require for Israel to finally, or sorry, Egypt to finally let Israel out? 10 plagues. How many days did Jesus require his disciples to wait in Jerusalem after he ascended to heaven until they were endued with power from on high? 10 days. They were required, right? How many commandments did God require Moses to give Israel from Mount Sinai? How many commandments? 10 commandments. So there was a requirement given. How many disciples did Jesus have? 12. 12. Yeah, I couldn't fool you this time. All right. <clears throat> um, what percentage of our income does God require of us as our first fruit to give him before he releases the blessing on the rest? You see what I'm saying? There are patterns of, 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 of numbers in scripture that God has principles attached to for his plan and purposes. And so we see this 10 percentile thing happen. By the way, the word 10 percent or 10th, if you will, simply is translated to the word tithe. That's what the word tithe means. So if I say tithe, some of you go like, <gasps> okay, let me just use a different word, 10th. Okay, it, that's all it means. And so God <clears throat> incorporates the 10th. Now, um, go with me now quickly to Malachi chapter three. And I've only got a few minutes left and we're gonna pick this up again next week. But Malachi chapter three, I wanna begin reading at verse eight. Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament. Malachi, the prophet Malachi is speaking to the nation of Israel for their disobedience and mistrust with God. They failed to do what God was asking them to do according to the commandments that, or the ordinances that God established. And so he speaks to them in verse eight about them stealing or robbing from God. Now, by the way, um, I think it's important. Well, let's just read this first, then we'll get to it. For I am the Lord, verse eight, sorry, not verse six, verse eight, will a man rob God? That's the question. Yet, here's the answer, you have robbed me. And then we would say, in what way have we robbed you, God? And the answer is, in tithes and offerings. In other words, in not giving, in not trusting me with the tithe and with the offerings. You are, watch this, watch what he says, you are cursed with a curse. Now stop there for a second and just understand this. You say, well, if I don't, if I don't give my tithe, does that mean that God's gonna curse me? Okay, no, you curse yourself because you prevent the blessing of God from empowering your finances. See, church, when you trust in flesh, you're cursed, the Bible says, which, again, from, from remember Jeremiah 17? It simply means that you are lacking the empowerment or the ability of God to prosper or succeed. Yeah, right. When you take away from what God is required of you, you block the blessing from flowing. That's curse. Amen. You lack the empowerment of God to bless the rest. See, God's got a principle that when we obey his requirements, he blesses. So it goes on to say, you've, you've, you've robbed me with your tithes and offerings, not giving of your tithes and offerings, you're cursed with the curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. The storehouse simply means a place or a house where storage is kept for the provision for others. That would be, in, the, in our terms or our context, the local church. When you bring your tithe to the church, you give it to the Lord, it belongs to him, you're making provision in the house for others and for yourself. How many are benefited from the ministries of Champion City Church? You know that that comes at a cost. There, there are materials needed, there are bills to pay, there are things, right? You help supply and provide, right? Amen. Could you imagine going to a restaurant, sitting down for a meal, eating and leaving without paying? Okay, that's called dine and dash. It's not a good thing to do. 
right? Now, it does, you don't have to listen to me, church. <laughs> Please understand, we're gonna get more into this next week. I, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. You don't have to pay to eat here. Right. You get to pay to eat here. Because the difference between the law and grace is the law is you have to, grace is we get to. And I'll talk about this more next week when we try to come, you know, argue the point of, well, the tithe is under the law. Okay, we'll get to that a little bit more next week, some more. But I want you to understand, church, that under grace, listen, if the law asks for that much, grace asks for much more. So before you start using the, the law card, start looking at grace a little deeper. Okay, we'll talk about that next week. Come back next week. Okay. okay, would you come back? I know some of you are going like, oh, if you're gonna be talking about money, I'm not coming back. Okay. Okay, you got a heart problem. Because this should be pleasant, guys. This should just be, this should be helpful. I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm trying to help you. I, listen to me, I've said this before. I don't want your money. I want the blessing of God on you. And if it's going to require you to show your heart that's proven to God that you trust him with anything that you have, church, that's an open door for the blessing of God to fall all over you. It'll hunt you down, chase you down, bless you to overflowing. I want you blessed. Okay, so he goes on to say, Verse 10, bring all your tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and prove me now in this, says the Lord. Prove me now in this, says the Lord. Do you trust me? That's what he's saying. Do you trust me? Prove me now in this. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will be not room enough to receive it. Amen. Glory to God. You want your finances blessed? Give. And give to God what belongs to him first. You say, well, the tithe belongs to God. Where's that? Well, go, to, go with me. I'm glad you asked. Go with me to Leviticus. Leviticus, quick. We're running out of time. <laughs> okay, Leviticus, last chapter in Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 27. Look at verse 30. Look at verse 30. And all the tithe of the land. This is God commanding Israel. All the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. In other words, God says the tithe is mine. It's sacred. It's sanctified. It's holy. It's set apart. It's for me. Don't touch it. It doesn't belong to you. See, the problem that a lot of believers have is that, you know, they get their income and they spend it. They do whatever they need to do with it. And then if they have anything left over, okay, God, here, you can have the crumbs. God says, no, 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 that's not the way it works. You, you don't trust me. You don't trust me. If you're gonna give me the leftovers, it shows me you don't trust me. How about try giving me the first? Okay, now listen to me, church. There's a principle in scripture called first fruits. It's an ordinance. It's the way God operates. And by the way, church, it operated well beyond, 1,500 years beyond the law ever, ever showed up. It happened in the Garden of Eden. When God created Adam and Eve and put him in the garden, he said, he tend to the garden. You have the, you have the garden. It's all yours. Eat of every tree of the, the garden. It's yours except for one. What was God doing? He was testing their heart. That's right. can, you let, can you leave that one tree alone because that's mine? That's right. See, God put, God put man to the test right at the very beginning. He wanted them to realize, hey, I am God. You're not. I'm God. And if you're going to trust me, I'm going to require certain things of you that you can have, but you can't have other things. So are you willing to give up what is, doesn't belong to you in honor of me? Yeah. Okay, Adam and Eve unfortunately failed that test. They, eat of the, they ate of that tree that belonged to God. Yeah. Okay, step forward a few years. Next thing you know, you got Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel are the sons of Adam and Eve, right? Yeah. Okay, Cain was a farmer. Abel was a rancher. He was, he was a shepherd. He raised sheep. Cain, on the day of the offering, when they were bringing their offering to the Lord, Cain, out of his leftovers, the Bible says that out of it, you know, go with me there. Just find it real quick. Just want to make sure that you know where it is in Scripture as well. Let's just go there quickly. Genesis chapter 4. And I know my time is up, so I'm going to finish with this. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and, and, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time, his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. You know why Cain didn't raise sheep? Because he wasn't Abel. Okay, verse three. Okay, so verse three, see that joke always is, 
works. Okay, verse three, and in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering, okay? Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstlings of the flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry. Remember, you will be, you will love the one and hate the other, or you'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. Cain despised God because God was requiring something that was better than what Cain gave him. See, people wonder why did God accept Cain or Abel's offering but not Cain's offering? Well, because Abel gave a blood offering. No, that's not why. That's not why. The reason why God accepted Abel's offering and not Cain's offering is because the Bible says that Cain gave out of his he gave, Cain gave out of his, uh, 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 his harvest, right? Yeah. He brought an offering of the fruit of the ground, but it wasn't the first fruit of the ground. It was after. It was, well, you know what? I don't really need this much. I got all that I need now, and I got a little bit left over. I probably don't need that much. And so here, God, you can have that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Where Abel, as soon as he had his first lamb, he said, God, this is yours. Yeah. Not knowing he's going to have any more. He just said, God, this is yours. And God said, you trust me. I accept that, Abel. I reject that, Cain, because it shows me you don't trust me. See, God doesn't want the leftovers, church. He wants the first fruit. And when you honor him, honor him with the first, he'll bless the rest. Quickly. Do you have a second, two? Yeah, anybody give me one minute? One minute, just give me one minute. Okay, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so I got a few. Okay, no, really quick. One last example, one last example. Israel. Israel goes into Canaan after wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. And God brings them into the land of Canaan. And out of the cities that they are to possess, the first city was Jericho. And God told Joshua that what they were to do to take that city, okay, march around it once and on the seventh day, march around it again, blow the trumpet, shout, walls come down, they take the land, they take the city. But here's what God told them. When you take that city, the spoils that you take, the silver, the gold, all that you take from that city is mine. Okay, what's God asking for? The first fruits. It's the first city you take that belongs to me. Bring it back to the temple. Temple, sanctify it. Make it. It's going to be holy. It's going to be for my purpose, for my, my plans. Okay, but you're going to have to show me that you can trust me. So take all that spoil and bring it back to the temple. It's mine. One man, Achan, decided on that day of fighting that he was going to take some of the silver and the gold, put it in his pocket, go home, bury it under his bed, and hide it. And when Israel went to attack the next city, which was Ai, they were unable to conquer it, even though it was a smaller city, smaller populated, well able to be taken, unlike Jericho, they failed. And when Joshua went back to God and said, God, how did we fail? And God said, because you stole from me. You took what was mine. And because you took what was mine, I could not bless you in the next fight. Take care of that man. Take care of his family. I mean, God was pretty strong in the way that he dealt with Israel that day. But as they repented and as they dealt with it and they restored in their faith and their confidence and trust in God, God restored them and blessed them in their future endeavors. Church, here's the lesson that we need to learn. Don't steal from God what belongs to him. He asks something of you because he wants you to trust him. And when you give unto God what he's asking of you, he knows that he can trust you with more. He will bless you. We're going to pick this up next week as we get into the tithe in a little bit more detail because I want some of you to understand the tithe did not stop in the New Testament. As a matter of fact, if we, again, let's stand, let's stand. Please, if you're watching online and you're not able to make it here in person, please join me. Again, join us here next Sunday 
continue to grow in your trust with God. God wants to bless you, but he's gonna test your heart. Father, we thank you, Lord, this morning for this morning, for uh, the word that we, that we heard, the, the message that we're hearing. God, the, uh, Lord, what you're doing in our hearts and our lives. We want to just be all that you want us to be. We want to be obedient to your word. We want to follow you, Holy Spirit, and all that you have for us. Because we know, God, it's going to benefit not only us, it's going to benefit your kingdom. It's going to benefit others. So for God's sake, for your sake, Lord, we do it. Thank you for helping us to become better stewards and managers of finances, that finances would not have us, but we would have it and use it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks for watching. For more content, hit subscribe and make sure to follow us on social media. You can also visit championcitychurch.com for more information.